In this video, I will demonstrate how to perform a calculation for a value known as the numbers needed to treat. This is an evidence-based practice measure that gives us an idea of the efficiency or the effectiveness of a treatment or an intervention of some kind. Now, typically this is calculated as part of an intervention study in which we're subjecting participants to a particular treatment to see how they respond to that treatment. And then we can characterize the outcome as being either a positive or negative outcome. Negative being there's an, an event that happens that we don't want to happen, an adverse event, versus an event that we do want to happen, a positive event. So that might be, the adverse event might be something like heart attack, a stroke, or there's some kind of an injury, or, the, or it could be uh, not achieving a certain type of treatment uh, goal, and that would be the negative outcome. And so this allows us the ability to determine how effective the treatment is in preventing uh, that negative or adverse outcome. Now in order to calculate the numbers needed to treat value, there's a few preliminary calculations and values that need to uh, be calculated in order to help us get to the outcome that we want. Um, and I'll just define these quickly uh, so we get a sense of how they fit into the overall picture of calculating numbers needed to treat. So the first is the value of risk, also referred to as an event rate. And we typically will have two measures of risk or event rates. One for the participants that are in the experimental group, and this is known as the experimental event rate, or EER. And then we'll also have an event rate for the control group, the group not receiving the intervention. And this is known as the CER. This is basically just an expression of the frequency of a particular outcome. Uh, how many or what proportion of subjects in either group had the adverse outcome. Now the next is a relative risk, and this is how many times more likely an outcome will occur in one group versus the other. And this is typically used to determine risk in prospective designs, in which we're uh, placing participants in a group, subjecting them to the treatment, and then following them over time to see which of the outcome groups they may fall into. The next is relative risk reduction, and this expresses the reduction in the rate of the outcome in the treatment group relative to the control group. And this is very often expressed as a percentage. So it gives us an idea of what effect the treatment has in reducing the risk of a certain outcome in the treatment group compared to the control group. The next is the absolute risk reduction, and this gives us an idea of the absolute difference in the rates of the outcomes between the two groups. So it gives us an indication of how the treatment effect differs from the baseline risk that someone has for a particular outcome. And then the last value is the number needed to treat. Uh, and again, this expresses the number of patients that need to be treated in order to prevent one undesirable outcome. So for example, if we have a treatment set up in which we're trying to prevent stroke or heart attack, the idea is how many people would have to take this treatment or this medication to prevent one heart attack or one stroke. Now ideally the numbers needed to treat would be one. In other words every single person subjected to the treatment will have the undesirable outcome prevented or will not have the undesirable outcome. So we we look ideally for the number to be as close to one as possible and it's also somewhat relative is how we interpret that. And I'll talk about that a little bit more when we get to uh, our example. So those are the different values that we're going to, that we calculate in order to get numbers needed to treat. And each one gives us a different sense of how the treatment is actually affecting the potential of this adverse outcome. So what SPSS will do for us, unfortunately, it won't calculate numbers needed to treat. There's not a function in SPSS that allows us to calculate these things. But what SPSS will do for us is pre present or give us a standard two by two cross tabulation table, which we will utilize to then make the, the additional calculations that we need to make. So if we look to the top here of this slide, we can see we have our, our data set up in, in a typical two by two table. So on the left hand side here in the rows are the groups that the participants were uh, either allocated to or were in. So the top row traditionally will be uh, filled with the treatment group subjects and then the bottom row will be filled with the control group subjects. 
and then in the columns we have the outcomes. So the left hand column will be the, the outcome of interest, in this case the negative outcome. Did they have the injury? Did they have the illness that we're interested in? And then the right hand column will be uh, a positive outcome, in other words they did not have the negative outcome. And then the third column all the way to the right will be the total subjects that fall into each group. Once we have these values then we can perform these calculations. Now if your table is not set up in the configuration that I'm demonstrating here, then these formulas won't work properly. Uh, there are other formulas that are out there for different configurations of, of tables, but for our example here we're going to use uh, this system and we're going to use these particular formulas to calculate numbers needed to treat. So as we look at the, the data here we can see that um, of the subjects that had the negative outcome, and let's say for this example we have a treatment in which we're trying to prevent um, a stroke. And so uh, of the people that had the negative outcome that actually had a stroke, 56 of them were in the treatment group and 89 of them were in the control group. And then as we go to the next column we can see that of subjects who did not have a stroke or a negative outcome, we have equal distribution between the treatment and the control group. So just looking at, the, at this raw data, you may say to yourself, well, it looks like the control group seems to be more likely to have a negative outcome than the treatment group. But we can quantify that, that difference or that risk um, as we move through our, our different calculations here. So the first calculation we can look at is the risk or event rate calculation. And so as I mentioned before, we have our experimental event rate. So this is the, the risk associated with being in the experimental group. And then here is the CER, or the control event rate, and this is the risk of being in the control group of having the negative outcome. So the formula is quite simple. The calculations are quite simple. They're easy to do by hand. So we take the value in the A cell, and you can see I've denoted these as A, B, C, D, E, and F. We take the value in the A cell and divide it by the value in the E cell. So it's basically the number of people in the treatment group that had the negative outcome divided by the total number of subjects in the treatment group, which is 256. And so we end up with a risk or event rate of 0.22. Then we can do a very similar, similar calculation for the control group. The number of people in the control group that had the negative outcome divided by the total number of people in the control group gives us our control event rate, in this case 0.31. So again, we can see here that the risk of having the negative outcome is lower in the experimental group or the treatment group than it is in the control group. And so now we can look at the uh, relative risk. And so the formula for that is we basically take the EER value, in this case 0.22, and into that we divide the CER value, in this case 0.31. And that gives us a value of 0.71 over here to the right. And again, we can express that up as a percentage, um, but the relative risk, as we can see for the experimental group, is, is less than 0.1. So when we think about relative risk, we use 1.0 as kind of the baseline. So if there's a risk of 1.0 of having the negative outcome, then that's equally distributed between the experimental group or the control group. So both groups have the same level of risk of having a negative outcome. When we have a relative risk value less than 1, that's going to indicate that the experimental group has less risk of having a negative outcome than the control group. And again, the, if we go above 1, so if we had a 1.5 or a 2.0, that means the experimental group has a higher level of risk of the adverse outcome compared to the control group. So in order for us to say that the experiment reduces the risk of having the negative outcome, this relative risk value should be less than 1.0. Now the next thing we can look at is the relative risk reduction measure, and that's in our next, our next row here. And that again is a fairly simple formula and can also be expressed in, as a percentage, but we take our EER value and from that we subtract the CER value and then into that value we divide the CER value again and we multiply that times 100. So we have a risk reduction value of 0.29, relative risk reduction of 0.29 or 29 percent, which tells us that 
the treatment seems to be reducing the risk of the negative outcome by about 29 percent. The next calculation we have is the absolute risk reduction. So this gives us an idea of the absolute level of risk that's being reduced by the treatment. And so in this case we take our CER value and from that we subtract the EER value. So we take our 0 0.31 from that we subtract 0.22 and we end up with a absolute risk reduction of 0.09 or 9%. Again, we can express this as a percentage as well. Now the last value and the one we're most interested in here is the numbers needed to treat. And So as I mentioned before, this gives us an indication of the efficiency of the treatment. How many people need to be exposed to that treatment in order to prevent one adverse outcome, in this case a stroke. So we take our ARR value as a, as a decimal or as a fraction, not as a percentage, and we divide that into 1. And so if we take 1 divided by 0.09, that gives us the numbers needed to treat of 11. So that we would interpret that as we would need to expose 11 people to the treatment in order to prevent one negative outcome, in this case a stroke. Now that's fairly close to one and that seems to be a pretty efficient treatment. So we only need to to subject 11 people to a treatment in order to prevent one stroke. Um, that's a pretty efficient treatment. Now this is also somewhat relative to the severity of the of the negative outcome. So for example, if we were looking at a treatment that was designed to prevent death of some kind, maybe a sudden death, like a heart attack, um, a number is needed to treat of 100 would still be pretty good. I mean, if we can prevent one death with just 100 treatments, that, that's a pretty good return on, on the investment, so to speak, as far as uh, trying out a treatment on, on certain individuals. So for a severe, life-threatening kind of condition, adverse outcome, um, a numbers needed to treat can be fairly high, but still be pretty efficient. Now, if we had that numbers needed to treat of 100, and what we were trying to prevent was, let's say, an ankle sprain, that's probably not a very efficient treatment. We have to treat 100 people to, to prevent one ankle sprain. That doesn't seem like a very a lot of um, return on your, your investment, so to speak, as far as the treatment. So that's typically how we can interpret this numbers needed to treat. Um, and again, this is typically done when we have some sort of an intervention uh, and we're able to dichotomize the outcome as being either a negative or positive outcome. And as I mentioned before, this is a way for us to determine how efficient the treatment is and how effective it might be relative to preventing a certain negative outcome. So hopefully uh, you learned something from this video, and good luck using this technique in your own research.